Hello, this is Graham Wilson. In this video, I'm going to try to explain three terms that seem to confuse psychotherapists, trainers and students a great deal. To be honest, it frightens me a little how many people claim to practice in one of these areas without really understanding what the terms mean, where they come from and what the implications of them might be. The three terms, integrative, eclectic and pluralistic, trip off the tongue nicely and they sound all embracing as if the individual using them is not merely an expert in one field, but a whole range. Before we explore them, it helps to understand that there are probably five main aspects of human development. Physical, fairly obviously, mainly to do with the body. Cognitive, to do with thinking and thought patterns. Emotional, sometimes called affective. Social, sometimes called relational or systems. And the spiritual, which revolves around values and beliefs. Most people enter psychotherapy as clients when something in one or more of these aspects is affecting their quality of life. Similarly, most schools of psychotherapy primarily address one, or at most two, aspects of human development, though they will touch on all of them. Thus CBT, Cognitive Behavioural Therapy, is particularly concerned with cognitive development person-centred, largely with emotional and social development, psychoanalytic, with social and affective development, gestalt, with the social, transpersonal, with the spiritual. And while psychosynthesis is humanistic, it also has a transpersonal focus, and so on. Most therapists still train in one discipline first, then add new understandings later, sometimes in depth, but usually through relatively short courses as part of their ongoing professional development or CPD. It's relatively unusual for a therapist to obtain a diploma in one modality and then a second diploma in another. It does happen though, and when it does, the therapist benefits because many of the competencies of a therapist, such as core counselling skills, are found in almost every branch of psychotherapy. In 1972, Richard Erskine deli delivered a series of lectures at the University of Illinois, which were to form the bedrock of integrative psychotherapy. He subsequently written several books on the concept. Erskine originally trained with Carl Rogers and practiced as a person-centered therapist for some time. He subsequently trained with Eric Byrne and incorporated transactional analysis into his practice. The integrative approach is a philosophy of psychotherapy based on detailed models of human development, of personality and of change. Integration specifically refers to the process of uniting the affective, cognitive, behavioural and systems approaches within an individual's personality. In many ways, it provides the mechanism by which an individual in Rogerian terms achieves congruence by aligning their real self with their potential or ideal self. The second way in which the term is used in integrative psychotherapy is in the selection and use of different therapeutic approaches with one client. However, this is not about dipping into a tool bag and pulling out the right wrench to fix a nut. The therapist needs to understand the theoretical basis of any school of therapy that they intend using. They approach this understanding from the perspective of relationships. Relationships are, to Erskine, one of the, the central unifying characteristics of all forms of psychotherapy. Most forms of therapy are concerned with some kind of aspect of relationship. To practice as an integrative psychotherapist for some time, you have to commit to attending an annual residential intensive program facilitated by Erskine and his colleagues. This was a fairly common approach in the 60s and 70s. These were not open to students or early career therapists. The attendees were almost all masters or doctoral level practitioners. You had to have experience of working in depth with at least one core therapy. The purpose of the intensives was obviously in part about community building but it also provided the opportunity for the practitioners to develop their understanding of new developments in their various disciplines. Erskine was an early advocate of both evidence-based practice 
and ongoing professional development. These two principles are also at the core of integrative psychotherapy. So I think it's important to stress that the selection of tools in this case is not based on subjective choices by therapists who happen to like a particular handful of ideas from various places, often with only superficial training in them. Instead, it's based on a core therapy training, then a deep understanding of the central unifying characteristics of several forms of psychotherapy. When working with a client with, for example, relationship difficulties, the therapist makes informed choices about which approach to use and monitors their impact. Sadly, many therapists describe themselves as integrative without having given much thought to what this means. A surprising number of therapists say that their approach is eclectic. By this, they mean that they customize the therapeutic process for each individual by using whatever form of treatment or combination of treatments they believe will be most effective for treating the particular problem. Bear in mind that most modalities have their own specific core model of human development and that to be deemed sufficiently competent to practice them on your own typically takes a student at least two years training beyond the two to three years of counselling skills training that they will have done initially. Assuming that these core skills are present, you might expect such therapists to have had longer training, greater experience and a string of qualifications. However, while most of the tools that eclectic practitioners draw upon are proven, this is in the hands of those who have had this kind of extensive training in them. In practice, then, most eclectic therapists have studied one approach in depth, have encountered seemingly useful ideas from other modalities through articles or training sessions, and then try them out on their clients. It could easily be argued that this is unethical. There are three ways in which modalities are combined by eclectic therapists. Technical eclecticism, pioneered by Arnold Lazarus in the early 1970s, avoids any kind of underlying core theory. Prescriptive eclecticism, promoted by Richard Diamond in the late 1970s, is closest to a medical model, placing emphasis on evidence-based clinical judgment and assuming that the therapist has sufficient clinical knowledge to make these decisions. Systematic eclecticism was promoted by Larry Beutler in the 1990s. It tries to adopt a more holistic view of the client, with the decisions being based on the problem, the context, the environment in which the client is living, their motivation at the time, and so on. It's probably fairest to say that among psychotherapy scholars, eclecticism is both philosophically and practically a challenge. While there are some strong arguments in its favour, the variation in ways in which it's applied, the often retrospective justifications for a chosen approach, and the lack of a clearly rigorous training for its practitioners, make it very hard to validate. In the late 1990s, there was a lot of territorial conflict between different therapy schools, certainly in the UK. Each claimed to be better than the rest. Cooper and MacLeod devised pluralistic therapy in response. It's a philosophy for therapists in which they agree to honour other schools, to accept that there are many ways to come to a solution, that they should all look at their own training with a critical eye and that therapy isn't just significant at the individual level, but also engages with socio-political debate and change. It's often described as a development of person-centred therapy in which the therapist supports the client while they find out which methods and theories are best for them, largely without direction from the therapist. And the therapist then tailors their approach as much as possible to each individual client. In some ways, this is the same as an eclectic approach, but it places much more emphasis on person-centred conditions and the preparedness to explore approaches outside your own domain. There are now a couple of textbooks about it, dated 2011 and 2015, and there have been at least two international conferences dedicated to pluralism. However, there is, as yet, very little experimental evidence to support it. 
what there is, could be seen as reflecting the person-centred approach rather than the pluralistic directly. Some pluralistic therapists aim to practice only their core modality and then to refer clients on if their needs are different. Others seek to offer a pluralistic practice. However, the network of communicating and collaborating practitioners is seen as a characteristic of this approach. Thank you for watching. This was Graham Wilson. Your feedback is always welcome, as are ideas for future courses, classes or videos.